If we have not had the privilege of meeting just yet, my name is Daniel Groves. I serve as the teaching pastor here at Hope City. And uh, y'all get to hang out with me this weekend. Pastor Jeremy will be back in the house next weekend. How many of y'all enjoyed Pastor Mekon in April last weekend, though? Wow. If you were not here, if you were not in the building, you can go back and watch online. It was a really, really right now powerful word from Pastor Mekon. And then where's all the ladies at? Man, ladies night. I heard, I couldn't be in the, they wouldn't let me in the room because I'm with the lady, but they had a, an amazing time. Uh, Miss April brought it, and I heard it was an incredible night. I think we should have the Carters back. What do y'all think? Hey, it's game day. I want to give away a couple uh, t-shirts. A couple, I saw you. I saw you. I'll give you that. And then I'm going to go, I'm going to go, I'm going to go deep. I, I see. I'll rub, let's go right there. Uh, it was a little short, a little short. That was terrible. Some of you are like, stop throwing, white boy. Okay. Hey, let's also give a shout out to our pastors, Pastors Jeremy and Jennifer, leading so strong. I, I want to give a shout out because Pastor Jeremy spoke this last week at Convoy of Hope's national event. Last summer during COVID, we got a phone call for Convoy of Hope, and they said, hey, they're one of our partners, and they said, would you go a little deeper with us with audacious faith and believe for us to be able to feed globally 10 million people? And see, when you put a challenge like that on Pastor Jeremy, he's like, do not threaten me with a good time. Let's go. And so we partnered with him. Pastor Jeremy spoke at the national event last week. The director came to him and said, listen, because of Hope City's partnership, if y'all want to know where your, where your giving is going to, listen to this. Because of Hope City's partnership and some other church partners, we surpassed the 10 million big time. And we have served, listen, over two and a half. No, I'm going to say it again because I messed it up. Over 200 million people were fed globally. Somebody should shout. That's huge. Also, yesterday, our Hope City missions team went out, and we did 10 serve projects around the city. I'm going to give you some stats real quick. Over 120 Hope City volunteers served 250 hours. Over 180 total volunteers serving 340 hours. And this is amazing. Right here in our city yesterday, just yesterday, we served 22,000 425 meals to people in need. I think that's incredible. Our team is crushing it. Also, before you walk out today, we're kicking off Connect Groups. How many of y'all are fired up about Connect Groups? How many of you guys have been a part of Connect Groups in the past? Like, you know what I'm talking about? Maybe Freedom. My wife and I lead a marriage one. Like, we love it because Hope City is large enough to make a massive dent to do damage to the kingdom of darkness. We're large enough to, to do some amazing things for the kingdom, but Connect Groups make us small enough so that you can find your place. So you can go to hopecity.com slash groups. You can also text groups to 474747. On your way out, you can sign up. You can go on the website. But I'm telling you, do not do life alone. Look at the person next to you and say, don't do life alone. Come on. <laughs> it's game day weekend. I'm fired up about game day weekend. Now, I, I just want to do a quick poll. How many guys just could care less about the Super Bowl this year? Come on, just a little. Okay, okay. How many guys are going for the Chiefs? Let's see all the Chiefs. Okay. All right. How many guys are going for the Buccaneers? Oh, that's better. How many guys are literally going to watch for the commercials? Okay. How many guys are like, I'm literally going to watch commercials and just eat a lot of wings? Come on, that's me. It's going to be a great day. You know, as I was praying about this weekend, uh, I, I could have come up with a, a sermon that like tied all together, like, and the Holy Spirit's the coach, and Pastor Jeremy's the quarterback, and we're going <laughs> to... And here's the truth. If you want a great football tied together sermon, you can go back to game day 2020. I did a sermon called The Huddle, but I really felt in my spirit that we needed to stay in week number two of Stuck in the Middle. Is that okay? Thank you for your overwhelming enthusiasm. Is that okay? Um, last week, Pastor Mekon broke down some pretty amazing things. One specific thing he talked about was falling asleep. And there's some really amazing things that I believe he unpacked about being stuck in the middle. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that and unpack that more because here's the reality. Stuck in the middle, when you're stuck somewhere in the middle, it's a little messy. It's not super pretty. Sometimes it's frustrating. How many of you guys will agree? When you've been stuck in the middle, it's a little frustrating. You're not quite to where God has told you and the promises and everything that he's assigned your life, and there's still that sting and that frustration of the past, and you're just kind of right here in the middle. And I'm gonna talk about a couple heroes in the faith and some people in the Bible that were stuck in the middle. Because here's the truth. Most people lose the battle in the middle. God never promised that we would reach our destinies out opposition, without disappointments, without things we don't understand. The scripture clearly says it right here in 1 Peter 4, verse 12. Watch, dear friends, 
See, he said that real soft and kind because it was going to get heavy. It's like, dear friends. Then it says this, don't be surprised or shocked that you are going through testing that is like walking through fire. Here's the truth. God is still on the throne. Nothing that's happened in your life has caught him off guard. I need you to know that today. He's not like, oh, myself. I didn't see that one coming. Her house payment's late. I, Gabriel, look, I didn't even know this. Nothing in your life has caught him off guard. Everything he has promised to fulfill, everything that he said and all the intentions of them coming to pass, I'm telling you, God is still with you. A lot of times we have that boldness and that audacious faith to start. Where's all my starters at? Like you like, man, you're a big starter. You know, you just jump in. You're like, I'm gonna knit these things together and sell them on Pinterest. And then about three months in, you're like, no, nobody's buying those. <laughs> Literally, no one wants to buy little hats for cats. I don't know. <laughs> I even thought it was a catchy name. <laughs> we have faith a lot of times to start. We have faith a lot of times in the end. A lot of times, we don't have faith in the middle. So my question for you in week number two of Stuck in the Middle, will you have faith in the middle? There's two realities that we face whenever we're stuck in the middle. The now and the not yet. When God gives a promise, a lot of times he'll fill you up with that courage. I just said a moment ago, that boldness to to start it, but here's the reality. A lot of times God will give us directions and not the details. Is that just me? Like he gives you a word, says you're gonna do this, and you're like, I'm ready, God, and then it's like silence. You're like, what happened? I, I thought you wanted me to do this. A lot of times he'll give you direction and he won't give you the details because somewhere in the middle, there's aggressive and supernatural change that begins to happen. Sometimes in that stretching, sometimes in his silence, sometimes in redirection, it actually ends up protection. I know in my wife and I's life, anytime we were asking God to show up, breathe into a situation, tell us direction, clarity, wisdom, even if he was silent, I knew he was working. Pastor Jeremy says, I trust him because I know too much about him. I trust him even when I can't track him. So how many of y'all, where's all my people out that are in the middle? Come on right now, let me know. I, uh, I was reading in, in, I love Proverbs 16 now. It's one of my favorite verses. And this translation in the Amplified says this. Because it's really easy, again, to get off course when we get in the way. It says a man's mind plays, a, ma a, man, a man's mind plans his way as he journeys through life. But the Lord directs his steps and establishes them. And I kind of think about it like a supernatural GPS. Pastor Jeremy talked about Waze. How many of y'all, where's all the Waze people out? Like you use Waze religiously. Where's Google Maps? Like, okay, Apple Maps, is anybody? Okay, okay, cool. Uh, MapQuest, you're still, still printing it off? <laughs> Reading it, people are like, this. <laughs> some of y'all know what I, some of y'all refuse technology. You're like, I'm not, they're tracking me, so I'll just print it up and follow it that way. I was driving to uh, the video shoot for that, that ridiculous uh, wig-wearing coach moment <laughs> video. And uh, I was driving, I, I created plenty of margin. Anybody who knows me knows I like to be on time. 15 minutes is on time, early is on time. On time is late, five minutes late is unacceptable. Like that's just the way I'm wired. And, and so my wife's like, I got four kids. And she wears a shirt that says, sorry I'm late, I didn't wanna come. So I'm like, oh. You're not trying to be on time. But anyways, I, try, I was trying to be on time. All was well. And then my, my, my GPS, it, it started rerouting me. And I was like, why? Why? I know better. I know the route. I do this all the time. And it kept rerouting me. I was getting frustrated because I'm looking. I'm like, it's not, even, it's not even showing up yet that it's like red or yellow. Or it doesn't look congested. So I knew better. And I ended up pulling up on West Park Tollway. And this is what ended up happening right here. For almost 90 minutes. I was sitting in this parking lot, literally. Like, people were getting out of their cars, like, having conversations. I'm like, y'all, we're not going to die here. I'm not staying here. Like, this. But sometimes this is what our life looks like. We started going our own way. We stopped listening to the Holy Spirit because newsflash, the Holy Spirit is always speaking. Always. It might be a still small voice. It might be a little, a little gut check, a, a nudge. Some might call it a, a intuition. But the Holy Spirit is always speaking. He never is not speaking. The truth is, distractions in life keep us from listening. I didn't listen, and I ended up stuck here for almost 90 minutes. I was blowing up the team, like, guys, I don't know if I'm gonna make it. Like, you're gonna have to send like a helicopter, like something's gonna have to, Hope City has connections, what can we do? 
And this police officer, you can't see it, he pulled up next to me, and I was trying to get his attention, like, where, where you're going, wherever you're going, I'm gonna follow you. And if I get in trouble, I get in trouble, because I'd been there a long time. He backs up, flips his lights on, and starts driving the opposite way. So I followed him. I thought that was the right move. So he's exiting the on-ramp and notices that I'm behind him. And I'm like, this is gonna go one of two ways. <laughs> like, I'm about to borrow some money as I'm getting arrested. <laughs> And I, follow, and I see him, he does one of these. And I was like, yeah. And so I ended up following him all the way down. He went left and I went right real quick. I went right. <laughs> Started from the bottom and now I'm right here with you guys. And it all turned out okay. But the truth is, when we're going our own way, the Lord, he's always speaking. He's always nudging. We were on a trip years ago. And uh, I, I've, I've done music for a long time pre uh, when I had hair. So if you Google me, you won't recognize me. The Lord gives and takes away. He gave me a, he gave me a beard and took my hair. It is what it is. But, but we used to travel on this bus, and, and, and that particular trip, I was like, I'm going to drive. I'm going to be the one that drives. It's crazy. So we're driving, and I felt the Lord. I felt a nudge, literally. It was like a stop, break. And it's like beautiful. It's Colorado, the hills. Like It was amazing. And I'm like, I literally said, why? Because there was nothing around us. And I felt it again, break. We had a whole team with this. My wife was in there. I think our, we had our first two babies in there. And so I just hit, I hit the brakes and I was doing anywhere between, it depends if you're taking dumb notes, anywhere between 50 and 90. I was somewhere. <laughs> so, but then we're in a huge coach. Like, so it takes a little while. You hit the air brake. I hit the brake and I'm, no exaggeration. It wasn't 10 seconds later, not one or two, but a bunch of deer ran out in front of us. Some would say, well, that's a coincidence. I'm saying, I'm gonna give that one to the Holy Spirit. But so many times we try to just do it on our own. And a lot of times when we do it on our own, we get trapped in the middle. Here's a hero of faith that we read about, a man who had some messed up situations. We all unanimously agree that David was not perfect, but he was the only, if your name's David in here, don't look at him. We're like, are you talking about you? We're talking about the Bible. So David wasn't perfect, but God had given David a promise. He said, I'm giving you this promise, but God did not give David the details. David knew he would be king because God gave him that promise. But he didn't realize that he would also have to face a giant twice his size. Yeah, that's the details. David knew he had the promise that he was gonna become king, but God did not tell him that Saul would be chasing him through the desert trying to kill him. See, as we study through the great heroes of our faith, one common denominator that I have found is that they all had to have faith in the middle. When it looked impossible, when the promise seemed so far off, they kept moving forward in the process. Look at the person next to you and say, got to keep moving. Come on, let them know. Because it is a faith-filled fight in the middle. When your faith is in God alone, God will make things happen that you never could happen. There's a reason, though, that God is constantly, I feel like, keeping the details from us. Because I know for me, I'm an Enneagram 8-7. I'm going to jump in quick. And I feel like he doesn't always give me the details because the truth is, and maybe you're not like me, but maybe you are, you'll mess it up. I used to always say that the Lord didn't reveal to me uh, that I was gonna marry Jackie right away because I'd have messed it up. I'd have been like, what's up, girl? My voice would all gotten all warm. I'd be like, what's up, how you doing? <laughs> but it's, instead, it was a journey and I'm grateful. But it was something that he planted in my heart when I first met her, that this potentially could be the one and the details were a little foggy. And I'm grateful. We're celebrating, what, 18 years this year. It's amazing. No, 17 years. 17 years this year. Come on, clap again. But 21 years as best friends. Come on, clap again. Okay. The truth is, God has never promised us, I said this a moment ago, that we wouldn't have adversity, that we wouldn't walk through things. He actually stretches us in the middle. These moments are absolutely essential because every time you go through something and every time you're in the middle, it's another level up. Amen. Hebrews 11.1, 1, as your faith gets stretched, it says this, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. Another Bible hero, a man named Noah, some of you have been in church for any amount of time, student of the Bible, you know the story about Noah and the ark. I thought about finding some old Assembly of God church that had the felt felt that I was going to put them up. I'm like, that's Noah. 
and that's a donkey. Like I was going to put all these things up here, but I just, we didn't have time. And, 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 but, but Noah, and I was going to make a joke that said, and, and then God asked Moses to build the ark. It's a joke because it's Noah. Okay, anyways. But God gave Noah a promise. He said, hey, I need you to listen. But God actually gave Noah a few more details in the middle of the promise. And when we read it in scripture, you think it all was downloaded instantly because that's the culture we live in now. Everything's fast. But do you realize in this story that Moses, no, nope, Noah, was in this middle place for 120 years? So God gave him the promise, you need to build a boat. We're gonna call it an ark. And then it's, it's hard to tell how long the timeline was before he started giving him the details. But then he started giving him the details and he said this, you're gonna build an ark that's 450 feet long, 75 foot wide, 45 foot tall. It's gonna have three decks, divided rooms, and a door on the side. You have to find one of each animal, male and female. You're gonna have to have enough food and you're gonna have to pack the boat. This is amazing. For those of you who maybe are new to the Bible, they had never seen rain before. So for 120 years, he's building this huge ark and people are like, hey, bro, there's no need for that huge ark. What are you doing? Mocking him, making fun of him because the water used to come up from the ground and water the earth. Over 120 years, I'm sure he got weary. I'm sure in the middle he was getting frustrated. But Noah stayed on mission and he had faith in the middle. Then the great flood came. Everything that God had been saying would happen, happened. Noah had steadfast, deep roots planted, unshakable, audacious faith. And I believe we need to have that type of faith. Come on, when we're in the middle, we need to have that type of unshakable, deep rooted in the Bible, in the word of God, in his presence sort of faith. So I encourage you, go back Genesis 6, read that story if you want a great, fascinating thing. I, I love it. I love going back and reading these stories because I'm like, that is, that is amazing. And you can Google it as well. But I believe if you will allow God, because I've said this so many times, if you've heard me preach before, you know I'm going to say it again, that God's not a forcer, he's a filler. And if you'll make room, God will get all the way up in your life. And the thing that you're in the middle of, you're not in it alone. I think that's one of the greatest lies is to try to get you thrown off courses. Hey, you're in this on your own. No, God is in the middle of it with you. The presence of God is always with you. One of my fathers in the faith said, if you're at the club acting messy, you know who's right there on the dance floor watching you? The Holy Spirit. He's always with you. The presence of God is always with you at the start, at the end, and in the middle. In the middle of the marriage, in the middle of that financial disaster, in the middle of that addiction, in the middle of that family dynamic, in the middle of that diagnosis. He is the God who will meet you where you're at and he'll meet you right there in the middle. Now the Bible story in Exodus 14, we're Bible church, so we're gonna talk about Bible stories. Of the, that's okay. Exodus 14, when God brought the Israelites out of slavery, they were headed towards the promised land. God had showed them their destination and said, hey, it's gonna be a land that flows with milk and honey. It's a little, it's a little bizarre. I just think that's real sticky. So much milk and honey everywhere. This is that's the way I think. I'm sorry. The real pastor will be back next week. He gave them this promise, but there was something in the middle where the details begin to get foggy. Like, hey God, you brought us all the way out here. Now what? And God didn't say, Good luck, figure it out. No, God was right there in the middle. So when they begin to say, Hey Lord, we need food, we need substance, we need something to keep us going. Every day, God supernaturally provided manna. For those of you who don't know, that's like a gluten-free baguette. <laughs> Every day, they had enough. Philippians 4.19 says that God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Even in the middle, he's faithful to complete the work he started. Even in the middle, he'll provide and show up and give you exactly what you need. They said, God, we need meat. We need something more than just bread. And God shifted the direction of the winds and thousands and thousands of quail begin to come in their direction. When they were thirsty, there was no streams, there was no river, they didn't have water in the middle of the desert. God brought water out of a rock. Come on, somebody. The God, come on, man, he is big enough and strong enough to provide everything you need right when you need it. He protected them from the enemies when Pharaoh changed his mind and began to pursue them and they were caught. They were caught at a dead end and they were trying to figure it out. God supernaturally parted the waters and took them on dry ground again and again, over and over. God showed them favor and he made things happen because God is not just the God of the start. 
He's not just the God of the finish. He's the God of the middle, and he's right there with you. Again, look at the person next to you and say he's right there with you. Come on, let him know. I was, uh, I was praying the other day because, you know, all of us go through these seasons, and I was thinking back through middle moments, moments where Jackie and I were just in the in-between place in our lives, and I remember when she was pregnant with Brecken, and I've shared this in the past, but she was pregnant with Brecken, and we went in for our ultrasound, the second one, and it was kind of the final one, and, and no, he was measuring big, so they wanted to do another ultrasound, and so when we were in there, the, the ultrasound tech got a little awkward, and then she came back in and said, the doctor said, you, you guys need to go to the hospital right now. The baby's in distress. Amniotic fluid is super low. And it was like panic or pray. I mean, it was either worry or, or put it in God's hands. And I remember being in the middle. I remember not being able to hear God's voice, trying to figure out what was next, what we were going to do, how we were going to get through it. And we drove super fast to the ER, and she was so calm. We just turned on worship and she was singing along and I'm thinking like, but what are they saying? But what are they gonna do? But what are they? And she said, don't worry about it. There's nothing we can do with worrying. We were in the middle. And even though we didn't feel this cloud fill our car, like this is wild, the Lord is here. And he's moving up my shirt. like, <laughs> super weird. I don't know what that was. But we got in to the hospital and the doctor said, I don't even know why they sent you here. Your baby's not in distress at all. His amniotic fluid is great. Something happened from the ultrasound to the ER right in the middle. Because in the middle, I'm telling you, there are signs, there are wonders, and there are miracles that God wants to unlock in your life. He promises us in Isaiah 43, 2, when you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you're not going to be burned up. The flames will not consume you. So again, there's this constant conflict. There's this tension between the sting of your past, the what if I slip back into this, and then there's this confidence and faith of what is. God is constantly trying to pull us back, and I believe in the middle, in the gap, there's two things that God wants to produce in your life. Write this down. Two things in the middle that God wants to produce in your life. The gap in the middle should produce gratitude. I don't know about you, but Jesus is the only reason I've made it this far. I, I, I'm serious. Like, I never should have made it. From the very beginning when I was born in an accident and almost aborted, the messy Jerry Springer episode, <laughs> atmosphere I was in, in, in as a kid, all of that was messy. I never should have made it. Me even having a microphone and declaring the good news to people is a miracle. So the gap for me, when I'm not quite where I want to be and I'm not where I used to be, this gap is constantly producing gratitude. I'm looking back saying, devil, I may not be where I want to be, but look, look, this is all that God has done. He showed up for me here. He delivered me there. He set me free here. He healed me here. The gap should produce gratitude. How many of y'all, just, just show me, because I we're, we're, this is not a perfect people church. How many of y'all know you never should have made it? Come on, I'm going to look around the room. Let's go. I posted this on Instagram yesterday for my friend, uh, Real Kim. She said, uh, when someone tries to put hurt back on you or remind you of your past. So I shifted it. When the devil tries to remind you of your past and you're right here in the gap and the conflict of where God is taking you and the conflict of having gratitude, the enemy will try to mess with you and try to bring back up your past. And she said, she said this, I love it. She said, when, when, when somebody tries to bring up your past to hurt you, it's like they're going back and robbing the old house you, you used to live in. That stuff's not mine. That ain't my stuff no more. You can't be throwing it in my face anymore, devil, because God wiped my slate clean through my sins as far from the east as the west. Come on, shout out loud. That ain't my stuff. Come on. I believe with all my heart that this tension between gratitude and purpose it's almost like a tug of war. I'm gonna ask my friends. I had some friends I talked to. Can y'all come up here real quick? Uh, it's almost like tug of war. You know, when you've played tug of war, maybe. I never liked tug of war. I was got super frustrated. I was never that great at it. I was born with some would say uh, without muscle mass. <laughs> but life feels like a game of tug of war. And again, there's this constant conflict, this tension where sometimes God gets your attention 
and he begins to pull you towards your purpose. And, and, and man, you feel like you're winning. Things are going good. And then the enemy reminds you, do you know how messy you've been? And tries to pull you back. And this is comfortable because y'all know misery finds company, right? So you start gravitating and almost clinging back towards this. And God's like, hey, let me get your attention and pull you back to where there's miracles and pull you back to where there's breakthrough and pull you back where your story matters. And then the enemy get, begins to get in your head again. It's this constant tug of war. And my wife and I were talking yesterday and she said, you know what's amazing about tug of war? Yes, this person and this team has to be strong and they're doing their best, but it's all settled and it's all determined in the middle. Come on, somebody, because at the end of the day, y'all are good and y'all are bad, so pull them out. Let's go. Give them a hand for helping. But I truly believe that if we will position ourselves, but recognize, be aware of the tug-of-war moments. Be aware that the enemy is doing everything. Y'all, the reason he's messing with you so much, the enemy is not attacking you because you're weak. He's attacking you because of your purpose. He knows that if she would just figure it out, there is truly healing in her hands. If he would just recognize who he is and who he is, whose he is, and he'll rise up and be who I've called him to be, it's, there's no limits to what I'll do through his life. But it's this constant tug of war. And my challenge for you in the middle of this is to stop clinging to what was comfortable. You know, the word cling literally means to stick to to hold on too tightly. Some of you are holding a badge that's not your name that says fragile. Some of you are walking through life with no joy because you're wearing a tag that says damaged goods. I said this earlier, but there's enough mercy for all of your mistakes. There's enough freedom for everything you've walked through. So stop clinging to it. And it's just not, this isn't my opinion. My opinion was to wear these Tinker Threes. That's my opinion. Here's what the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43. Verse 18 and 19, I love the way this one reads. This is, but the Lord says, do not cling to the events of the past or dwell on what happened long ago. But this part right here fires me up. But watch for the new thing I'm going to do. Y'all, that should fire you up. Don't cling to what you once knew. Don't cling to the past. Your past is not, your glory days are not in your past. Your faith should be my now and my next is God's best. I'm going to do a new thing, and it's already happening. You can see it now. I'll make a road through the wilderness and give you streams of water there. Look at the person next to you and say, quit clinging to things that you don't need to. Come on, let them know. That's a long sentence. Quit clinging to things you don't need to. So the gap produces two things. Number one, it should produce gratitude. Number two, the gap in the middle should produce growth. You've got to constantly be growing. Don't get stagnant. Don't get stuck in the parking lot on West Park Tollway like I did. But constantly be moving forward. Paul said, I have not arrived at my goal just yet. I haven't, I haven't obtained everything that I know God is asking me to obtain and walk in. But I choose to press on. We have to choose to press on when we're in the middle. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 says, Let the gift of undeserved grace and the understanding that comes from our Lord and Savior Jesus help you keep on Growing. The truth is, when we're stuck, and people have lied to you, like, well, the reason you're stuck is because obviously you miss God. Some of y'all need to stop listening to people. Get off Facebook and stop reading everything that people comment about you. And, but the truth is, when you're stuck, a lot of times you're, you lose your heart of gratitude and you stop, you stop growing. But then the shift happens. Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 8 says this, the Lord himself goes before you. That fires me up. The Lord himself goes before you and will be with you. He will never forsake you. He'll never leave you. So every step you take, he's already there. So don't worry about your past because you're not going that way. And don't worry about your future because he's already there. Every step you take, he's with you. Every move you make, he's guiding your steps. I was thinking about um, this story. My friend Matt and I were talking the other day. And uh, when we lived in the Midwest, so I'm from the Midwest. My wife's roots are League City, which is why we moved to Texas, y'all. We're not going anywhere. I love tacos and barbecue. Let's go. And the Midwest is super cold and it's snowing all the time. Just does not feel like the Lord's will. And so <laughs> we have friends watching from the Midwest. We love you. Lots of grace and peace on your life. So, 
So we moved to Texas, and, and, uh, but when we lived in Ohio, we had to drive like 10. All right, amen. Go Buckeyes, okay. So we, I paid him to do that. That was amazing. We would have to drive like 10, 11 hours to go to any kind of blue water, any kind of sand. And so we would drive to like Myrtle Beach and different places that way. And that's where we'd have to go. That's where you went. Like now you can go to Galveston, get some sort of weird rash, but it's water. <laughs> As you're leaving, they're handing you little tubes of cream. It's weird, but it's right there. The ocean's right there. We used to have to drive 10, 11 hours. And so I remember when we checked into this really cool place, uh, this really cool family style resort. The lady said, Mr. Groves, and I said, yes. And she goes, we're giving you an upgrade. And I was like, do I need to be in a different line that's not around normal people? Because <laughs> it's a big deal. So anyway, she's like, we're going to put you on the very top, the tippity top. You're going to be on floor number 12. And my wife's like, okay, that's fun. Lady's like, the view is, and when people, like, uh, this is the way they say it. She's like, the view is breathtaking. <laughs> like she was illustrating, like, her breath being taken. She, and I said, what? And she's like, it's breathtaking. I was like... I'm ready for a breath that gave you. So we get all of our stuff, all of our kids. We get all the way up on the top. And my wife, because you know, how many of y'all, where's all the parents with tons of kids? Like, you didn't stop at one. You had way more. Like, people think we're Amish. We're at four. Pastor Jeremy's like, are you going to have more? I was like, four no more. It rhymes. And he's like, but you get a tax break at like five and six. I'm like, honey, you could have twins. Okay. So my wife's like, we're going to go down to the beach. I was super impatient. She's like, no, no, we got to put all the sunblock. We got to slather these kids up. I mean, because you don't want to do it on the beach where they get sand and then you're rubbing it on. You're, it's almost like you're exfoliating your two-year-old. You're like, this doesn't seem right. And so we, it took like an hour to get everything together. We put floaties on the kids and we got to the elevator and we hit the button and we waited, y'all, like no exaggeration, like 10 minutes, just like, and you can't walk with four kids down 12 flights of stairs. And I'm like, this is interesting. And Jackie's like, should you call somebody? Maybe it's broke. I'm like, well, maybe, maybe they know about it. And then all of a sudden, the door's open. I was like, okay, we're good, we're good. And we get in, you know, fire code's like eight or nine people. There's like 30 in there because they're like, we're not making that mistake. We're riding this thing. So we're, we're like, okay, so we're in there and we're starting to go down and it's so slow. And then the doors open and we're only one floor down. We're like, how did that happen? And then like more people are trying to get on. You're like, no, no, we're, this seat's taken. Like there's no room. And then it went down like to 10 and then nine. Well, then on like nine floor when it opened, our kids started to run out because it had taken so long. And we're like, hey, hey, hey. And I got a point here. Hey, 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 no, 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 come here. This is not our floor. Say that out loud. This isn't my floor. And then we got to have floor eight, floor seven, doors open. My kids ran out. No, 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 guys, guys. This is not our floor. Why? Because we had a promise of blue waters. We had a promise of just putting the feet in the sand. Just, we had that promise. We weren't going to jump off on floor five with the weird glitchy light and the ice machine that's like leaking. Like we're not going to. Doors open. People are trying to get in and out. One lady, true story. One lady, the doors open. She stepped down. She's like, oh, this isn't my floor. And I was holding down the button to shut the doors. I was like, oh, too bad. <laughs> Sorry about that. Because we needed like we needed to make it lighter. Like we, you can't just be occupying. This is almost loitering. You shouldn't even be just hanging. I have a point. So I remember it took forever. It, it, no joke, no exaggeration. Probably thirty minutes to travel all the way down. I say that sometimes in our middle. Sometimes when we're stuck. Sometimes when we're discouraged, the doors open and we step out on the floor of disappointment. Some of you have stepped out on the floor of shame. Some of you have stepped out on the floor and you've been camping out on the floor of depression. You've stepped out and you're just kind of settled in. Like it would have been ridiculous for us to have jumped off on floor three and said, okay, kids, it's the rain and there's a little bit of water, just go dance in it. Like, no, 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 we had a promise and we knew ultimately we were going to get to the promise if we didn't give up. And I feel from the Holy Spirit today that God is about to reverse. And you can trade in that shame for the power of restoration. You can trade in that fear for God's hope today. And Because this is what ended up happening. I remember when we were standing there and it felt like everything wasn't working. There was this sound. Okay. Shep, do that one more time. 
<laughs> that's like the low budget ding. What, what does that elevator sound like? Okay, that's better. Come on, give Shep a hand. That was... Hit the sound again. Hit the sound one more time. See, for some of you, that, that, that just, your faith just leaped. That's the sound of healing. Get back on the elevator because it came back around again. You do not have to stay stuck where you've been. There are people that will live on these floors they were never called to live on, walk out a life of shame, walk out a life of struggle and anxiety and all kinds of things when God is saying, listen, I'm right here. I'm coming back around. The truth is, I've been with you the whole time. I believe today that God wants to heal some people that have been stuck in the middle. And Mekon spoke so eloquently last week him and April, as they've walked through life and different stories, that was their story. And I love that he looked at Pastor Jeremy and he said, you were there for me when I fell asleep. Sometimes when we get off on the wrong floor and we're stuck there and we're stuck in the middle, it's easy to fall asleep. It's easy to settle for the vending machine that's almost out. It's easy to lean up against that pop machine that has only off-brand soda and say, I guess this is my life. When God's like, Look out the window. There's blue waters right down there. And I remember when we got past the frustrating moment, because I'll be honest, like I'm sanctified, but I was getting frustrated. I was getting frustrated. And we got down there. As soon as we stepped outside and we heard the seagulls flying and we saw a seagull attacking a kid with a piece of bread, I'm like, <laughs> this is where we're supposed to be. <laughs> right here, right now. Would you stand to your feet for just a moment? The middle does not mean that God is not working. I said a moment ago in his silence, in our obedience to just lean into his word, lean into his presence, not treat the, his presence or prayer or worship like the glass box on the wall that says break, a case, break in case of emergency. Instead, you're just in his presence. And you say, God, I trust you even when I can't track you because the middle does not mean he's not working. In the middle is also an amazing opportunity to meet Jesus in a brand new way. Would you lift your hands for a moment? If you're here today, and maybe you've gotten off on the wrong floor. Maybe when I said the floor of disappointment, it was like, ah. Maybe you got off on the floor of discontentment. Maybe you've settled into just dealing with panic attacks. And you've just kind of almost owned it like it's part of your DNA. Maybe you're here right now, maybe you're watching, maybe you're at Katie and you've just kind of lived for so long with fear, you've almost entertained it like a friend. God, I pray right now that your supernatural power would meet every person where they're at. Those that feel stuck in the middle, God, I pray that you would give them a way out, that you would supernaturally meet them where they're at, and that you would show up and do what only a good God can do. Throw your weight around the room, God. Flex, heal, restore, deliver. Let this be a testimony Sunday, February 7, 2021, the day that diagnosis is reversed, the day that shame left officially, the day that fear and depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts, the thing that the enemy has been plaguing people's minds, that they're not good enough, that they're not pretty enough, that they're not creative enough. God, I pray right now, Lord, that all of that is lifted. As we first Peter 5, 7, cast our cares on you. Put your hands down. Look at me really quickly. I share my story a lot because I'm, I'm passionate. Because I believe that what God did in my life changed the entire trajectory of my entire family. My little boy at 12 tells me he wants to be a pastor. He's been telling us that since he was like six. So I'm going to be a preacher. He's like, hey, man. He said, better than you. I said, you need to take it easy. <laughs> My daughter wants to be a worship pastor. Nine years old. This thing's amazing. We're raising our kids up the way they should be, but that wasn't my story. When my mom found Jesus, and she surrendered her life. She was in the middle for a long time. I was talking to her the other day. I said, how did you get through that? She said, I just had to keep trusting God and I had to look at your dad through the filter of the way I knew God saw him. 
Because when he was cheating and using and hustling and acting crazy, I couldn't look at him like that. I had to trust God in the middle. And one day my dad showed up and some of y'all know the story. I have the microphone, someone will tell it again. Showed up to that little church where my mom had community. That's why we challenge you, don't do life alone. If it wasn't for this group of people at a little church in Commercial Point, Ohio, that lifted her arms and said, David will know Jesus. And your kids will not just survive life, but they're gonna make it. If it wasn't for the group of people, a church like Hope City, surrounding my mom in the middle. See, God used the people that were surrounding her and his presence in the middle to give her boldness and a fight and a confidence to rise up and see through the filter of faith the way our family was going to end up. My dad showed up on that Sunday morning, tried church one time, gave his life to Jesus, and everything changed. Because God will show up in a fight for you in the middle. Because you have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever. The God you Ooh. yours is the kingdom, yours is the yours is the name. Somebody's about to get free. I'm telling you right now, I feel the same. You have no rival. You have no evil. Now and for the God. Yours is the king. Yours is the glory. Yours. Can you lift your hands right now? Some of you are about to get unstuck. I just feel that. Say you have no right. give God praise. God, we refuse to stay quiet. We refuse to go quietly into the night, but we will praise you in the middle. We will rejoice in the middle. We will trust you in the middle, and we'll just keep on moving forward in the middle. With every eye closed just for a moment, if you're here and you say, Daniel, I, I needed this, but the truth is I am stuck in the middle because I don't know Jesus. Maybe your heart just was 
stirring the whole time and it just kept convincing you that there's more to life than the way you've been living it. And you say, I don't know him as my savior, but I want to. Or maybe you're here and you showed up and maybe you tried church again. Maybe you used to know Jesus and you got caught up in the prodigal life. And today, February 7, 2021, everything's about to shift in your life here at Hope City. We don't pray prayers for symbolic reasons. We pray because Romans 10, verse nine and 10 said to confess in your mouth, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord and everything will change. If you're watching online right now, everything's about to shift in your life. Heaven is about to lean in our direction today. I'm gonna count to three and we're not gonna embarrass you, but we wanna walk with you and help you grow. This is the most important part of the entire service at Katie, watching online, literally from all over the world. Maybe you're flipping through Facebook and it's caught your attention and maybe you're at West Houston. One, I wanna give my life to Jesus. Two, I wanna rededicate my life. Three, if that's you, would you just lift up your hand? Hands going up all over the room. I mean, more than I can count. Come on, Hope City, give them a hand. Hands are going up everywhere. Amazing. Come on, it's not too late. Wave at me if you wanna give your life to the Lord. Come on, wave at me. Say, you're talking about me. You're talking about me. I see you back there. I see you over there. Thank you. Amazing. I see you over there. I see you right here, man. I see you, bro. So this is what we do. We're all gonna pray. And we're gonna ask Jesus to shift and change things in our life. My dad, it was as if the thumbprint of heaven Thumbprint of God leaned down and touched my dad and everything changed. Don't be surprised if the cravings and addictions are gone. Don't be surprised if you begin to move into a completely different direction of healing and restoration because Jesus is at work. Everybody in the room, you're watching online, you can say yes to Jesus right now. You can type it in the chat at Katie. Everybody pray this prayer with me. Jesus, it's me. I've been living for me and it hasn't worked. From today on, I choose to live for you. I lay every mistake, every burden, all my shame at your feet, and I ask for your forgiveness. From this day on, I'm gonna live for you. You are my Father, you are my Savior, and you are my Lord, in Jesus' name. Come on, Hope City. Amen. Give God praise.